Welcome to Talented Ed by School Pro, and uh, this is where we delve into the minds of uh, visionary educators and leaders. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Scanson, and today it is the hugest honor. I am so thrilled to introduce our special guest, Dr. Salome Thomas L., also known as Principal L. Uh, I'm going to do just a little introduction here so you can hear more about him. Dr. Salome Thomas L., is he's not just an award-winning principal or teacher, he's internationally recognized speaker author, co-author of, I think it's, is it five best-selling books? Uh, five, five. I don't know about best-selling. I, I, I often say that, but I might, I might be uh, kind of stretching the truth. Uh -huh. five, I think they're good. I think they're good. Um, he's got a passion for resilient leadership. He believes in making courageous decisions, taking risks, challenging the status quo. And this is why he's my, one of my favorite educators of all times. So with that, don't miss, stay tuned, watch the whole thing. We're going to uncover some Secrets to uh, fostering maybe some transformational, transformational leaders, affecting positive change. With that, Principal L, please introduce yourselves to our listeners and our watchers today, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I mean, you 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 did an amazing job. Uh, I'm just uh, I'm happy to be in your presence, Eric. I know we we met some some years ago, and we mm -hmm. you know, the same work out here, you know, changing lives on a, on a daily basis. As, as school leaders and uh, mentors and role models for, you know, young people and adults. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I'm, I tell people, I'm just a kid who grew up in the inner city of, you know, North Philadelphia, raised by a single mom, uh, but who was taught that teachers are very important. And um, right. I was um, early on mentored and supported by, you know, some teachers and my coaches who uh, encouraged me to go away to college and come back and uh, teach in the same community where, where I grew up and, and that's where I sort of um, um sort of got my got my mojo and started teaching in a tough inner city school and wanted to teach some kids to kind of uh become resilient and overcome mm -hmm. obstacles. Started teaching chess, and I know we'll probably talk about that a little yep. later. That sort of became that became my vehicle. That was my my game changer. Was was really uh uh teaching kids chess and really teaching them um how to critically think and problem solve because I know those skills are much more important. They're often not measured on many of the assessments, no. we get, but will impact their lives much more than anything we will ever, you know, test them on. And um, it's, that was 36 years ago. And I'm, I'm still standing strong. I go to bed every night with satisfaction, mm -hmm. every morning with determination, 24 of those years as a school leader. And it's been, it's a hard life. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the price of leadership is conflict. So um, I'm happy to be here today with you and share with all my great, you know, Minnesota family. Yes. Uh, got some amazing um, uh, Jessica Cabine and you just got some awesome uh, folks who are there in your state. Uh, and, and it's always an honor to speak to them, speak with them and be in their presence. So, I mean, you talked a little bit about resilient leadership. Um, give us a give us an insight of just a couple of experiences that have really shaped maybe your belief and power in resilient leadership and, and maybe even defining it in the educational setting. It's um, you know, this, this is a job that, that really requires us to, to be courageous because many times we'll make decisions that, you know, most people uh, won't find either popular or won't be what they want to right. hear. It'll be what they need to hear. And, um, you know, early, I'll tell you, early on in my career as a principal, you know, I, my first year as principal, 1999, I took over a, um, a K-5 school, which was one block from the middle school where I worked for 10 years. And I had a middle school chess program and I wanted to teach students um, at an earlier age. And I started um, I started I started teaching kids chess now at the kindergarten level. Um, but I wanted to sort of have those middle school students in my building. And we had you know, enrollment had dropped. So it was, uh, we had room to grow and I wanted to grow the school to a K-8 school, but my teachers were opposed to it. And they said, we don't want those older kids. And <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I said, but if we don't want those kids that we send to the middle school, 
what are we saying about the children we sent to the middle school if we right. want to keep those students? And one thing I've known growing up in the city is that most parochial and most Catholic schools, they're all K-8 buildings. And 40 to 50 percent of teachers in many uh, uh, big cities send their children to private and parochial schools. So many of my staff members had their children in K-8 buildings, but right. yet we didn't want to teach them one. And, and, um, and so we had a big meeting. We eventually made the conversion. Um, I was proud of it, but I'm going to tell you what I learned from that was that as a young administrator, I didn't listen to them. What what I needed to do was prepare them for, prepare them for that transition. You know, working with middle school students, with adolescents, it's not an easy job. It's not. And I just assumed that that was something that they wanted to do and something they could do. There were some who were fine with it, but there were some they only struggled because they knew that that's a very challenging age. And I didn't seek their input. I didn't uh, uh, communicate with them. And that's something I've learned over the years that 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 teachers, children, parents, they want to be heard. They do. And, 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 and listening can be healing for some people. So probably my biggest lesson in my 24-year journey as a principal, I was an AP for almost two years before I became a principal as well, um, is that we need to make sure that the lines of communication are open and that we're listening to grow and get better. And I think that's how you become resilient sort of as a leader is listening and then becoming a learner as well. And I, let me know if I'm talking too much. No, no, you keep keep talking. My students often say, Principal, well, you're like a preacher. You don't teach, <laughs> preach and talk too much, you know. But well, um, you but, talked about like two years as AP. I, I mean, let's go back to your start. Tell us the the origin story of Principal Elf. Tell tell us your tell us your beginning. So that's really how uh, the whole I choose to stay constant movement, you know, got started. I was a teacher in in a, in a middle school, you know, teaching students chess. My students were national chess champions, and had kids going away to you know to good high schools, good colleges, and um, and I got a, my I, my principal called me into his office uh, one morning. He said, "Listen, I got a phone call." They want you to become an assistant principal at one of the nearby middle schools. I didn't know you were looking for another job. I said I wasn't looking for a job um, when in Philadelphia at the time. When you when you uh, want to be an administrator, you know you um, you have to take an administrative you know exam and they put you on a list. But you have to sort of select when you want. But I'd never communicate to them that I wanted to leave. I just wanted to be on the list when it was time for me to leave. Mm -hmm. But um, he said, no, they, the superintendent's office called and they want you to report to a new school on Monday. And I said, well, I'm not ready to report to a new school on Monday. And he you know, was telling me how he was disappointed that I wanted <laughs> to leave. You know, every, he said, I know why you know people want you. Everybody wants a winning chess program. And, and I said, don't worry, you know, I'm not leaving. And I went back to my classroom and I started teaching. And later on in the day, the office transferred a call up from the chief of staff from the superintendent's office and said, um, she said, I, I'd like to speak to you. I spoke to your principal and he said that, you know, you don't want this job we want to offer you. And we just, we always speak to the candidate to make sure that that's what you want. And I said, yeah, I said, you probably will never call me for another <laughs> administrative job. But I said, ma'am, I tell these kids every day that we don't do it for the money mm -hmm. that we're here because we want to impact, you know, young people. And, um, and if I leave on Monday, they'll know I left for the money. And she said, well, it is a $20,000 raise. I said, how much? And she said, $20,000 <laughs> raise. I said, yeah, all of that sounds great, but th th there's no way that I could leave these kids in the middle. It was the middle of the school year. Mm -hmm. and said, Maybe at the end of the year, I have a chance to say goodbye. I said, but I, they come in on money and I'm not here. That's not what I, I, I teach them. So respectfully, I'm going to have to turn down the position. And she said, you know, to be honest with you, when other principals hear that you turn down this job to stay in your school, I think they're all going to want to hire you. And uh, now later on, the, with the kids and teachers, the rumor was I turned down 50000 a brand new car and all this other stuff. But um, but the kids, students came to me, you know, later on and said, listen, you know, we appreciate you, you know, choosing to stay to be here with us. Mm -hmm. We made that choice as well. They didn't know it would become the title of my first book because I stole it from them. Mm -hmm. But they basically said, you know, we have options, too, but we just love, you know, being here. And uh, and it, it just for me, it just solidified. I love that. Voice, right. And, and, and commitment. My, yeah, definitely. Now, you know, later on, you know, in another year or so. 
um, I was able to, um, uh, I be, well, I became, and the next year I became an AP right in the same school. In the same school. I stayed there in the same school was AP. And then in a couple of years, took over principal job, you know, one block, you know, away in, in, in the same community and was able mm -hmm. to continue my chess program, make the connections with those families. So I was working in the elementary school from a middle school where that school fed into. So when I talked to those teachers about, I'm like, what kind of kids were you sending me if you don't want to keep these students? And the parents would always come to us in the elementary school and say, my kid is an honor roll student here. As soon as they go to middle school, now they want to be Mr. Cool. They don't want to study. Mm -hmm. Is there any way the kids can just stay here? And that was sort of like my motivation for wanting to uh, uh, expand the program mm -hmm. in school because the research is out there that adolescent middle school students who are in buildings that they've been in since kindergarten, higher grades, lower suspension rates, better attendance than students who are in, in, in middle schools. So um, big lesson for me. And that was how I got my start. And then, you know, while I was at the school, I, I started as a teaching math to special education students. And I wanted to find a way for those students to connect. And I knew that many of these students had parents and uncles who played chess. So I started teaching mathematics on the chessboard. And uh, and the students, you know, gravitated to it right away. Knights move on right angles, bishops move on diagonals. The chessboard is a large square that contains 64 smaller squares. But these students started playing chess, started beating me, other teachers, the other students, everybody started playing. And I thought I was just giving these students uh, math on the chessboard. What I was really giving them, Eric, was intellectual capital they were walking around the school carrying chess boards and if you don't assume anything else about a kid who carries a chess board you assume that they're intelligent they're intelligent smart. i learned early on as a teacher that smart is not something you are it is something that you can become mm -hmm. well that answers my question i was going to ask you is why chess like like where did the chess come from where did your passion of chess come from uh, well, my brother taught me when I was young, but he only taught me enough moves so he could continue to beat me. So when I was in college and I, when I started teaching, I really started researching the power and the benefits, you know, of chess. I started developing my own game. I never became an accomplished player, but enough to be able to teach students and challenge them until I could convince them to learn, you know, on, uh, you know, on their own. And the, I started taking these students out to compete against other elementary and middle schools and they started winning right away and these students started winning and I struggled with that because they became very arrogant very self-centered they didn't want to practice some were like practice you're talking about practice <laughs> and um and so I, I said I, I've got to find a way to up the challenge and I said we only compete against high schools and they started losing to these high school teams but then they started beating high school they beat central high schools one of the oldest high schools in the nation and um, and I started taking them to tournaments, took them to the U.S. Amateur mm. uh, Championship in Park City, New Jersey, we're in New York, and they came in first place in their division, defeated a team of four men whose combined age was over 200 years, never done before, you know, in this tournament. And they won a national I championship in Knoxville, Tennessee. Arnold Schwarzenegger came to visit our school, sir, after we won, you know, bragging about how he played chess when he was young, and he makes everybody on the movie set play chess, and then he made a big mistake when he came to our school. He challenged one of my students. And? One of my, one of my young ladies. And I said, Arnold, these young ladies, they're very good. And she said, Principal L, I treated him just like he was another guy. I checkmated him. <laughs> Arnold, <laughs> terminated the Terminator. Terminate the Terminator. Yeah, but then he wrote a check for our program for $20,000. Wow. And our school, we've never asked our school district for one dime to support our program. We've, you know, very you know, uh, cash strapped district. Our students have traveled all over Portland, mm -hmm. Seattle, Arizona, Florida. Students from our school even traveled to Yugoslavia to compete against the national team. Um, great experiences, a huge achievement gap in many communities, but a large exposure gap mm -hmm. as well. So chess for us was an opportunity. It was a great equalizer, it was a chance for us to close multiple gaps, you know, for our mm -hmm. young people. Uh, I'm going to come back to something that one of your coined phrases here, choose to stay. Yes, uh, right now in education, we're, we're in a crisis mode and we have people not choosing to even go into the profession and we have openings everywhere and the job is hard. What's your advice? How can we get more educators to choose to stay? It's um, that's uh, if that if listen, if, if I could come up with a solid answer to that question, I'd be a millionaire right now. Because we've lost 600,000 plus teachers 
since 2020. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a battle out here trying to hire. You know, I'm high, I'm still a full time principal, mm -hmm. so I'm always trying to hire teachers. It's like the Hunger Games out here, trying, <laughs> you know, you know, hire teachers. Um, and 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 also, I want the audience out here to realize when they hear that choose to stay, it's a choice. It's not a mandate. Mm -hmm. Those people who left the profession, that was their right. That was their choice. This the, the, the this teapot has been has been boiling for decades. Yes. You know, and just the pandemic just just knocked the lid right off of it. But teachers haven't felt supported. Administrators haven't felt supported. Uh, teachers haven't felt nurtured, underappreciated, underpaid. Yeah. We but knew it was coming. And it's a broken not. ecosystem right now, for sure. It, it, it really is. So my advice, my little bit of advice to any administrator who is out there, any school district official, any politician, any lawmaker, is that we have to find ways to make sure that we value teachers and we pay those teachers, mm -hmm. and we protect their time. We've got to start thinking that they only work 10 months. They work 12 months. They work year round. They only work until three o'clock. These teachers are after school, yeah, they are. work free overtime, often for hours. Then they go home and they work and they're grading. You know, we've got to eliminate all of these myths and then also make sure that we're building, like you say, an ecosystem that will that with the fabric of it the foundation is that we support we we create joy we allow them to be creative mm -hmm. we help them become resilient we we focus on the emotional well-being and we let teachers teach you can't be creative married to a state test so we've got to find a way to create schools and districts and systems where our teachers, they know what's best. We've got to find a way to allow them to work their magic and support them, you know, in, in doing it. If not, this situation is only going to get worse. And I'm a parent, and I believe you are too. Mm -hmm. right? We're going to end up educating our own children, you know, at home if we if we don't find a way to create these school cultures where teachers and students and parents are knocking the door down to get in, mm -hmm. knocking the door down to get out. And as leaders, it begins with us. We are the facilitators of culture and school. We've got to listen. We got to make sure that they feel heard, that they feel seen, that they understood. I say we need to create hubs in our schools for teachers and students. They need to be heard, mm -hmm. understood, and feel like they belong. H U B. If we can create schools with each and every student and staff member, feels that way, I think we'll be on the way. Now, this situation didn't get like this overnight. We're not going to fix it overnight. So we need long-term systemic changes, but it begins with small, simple steps that we're offering praise to those folks. Praise and a raise, right? So Praise and a raise. Yeah. Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> Got it. Um, here's what I love about you is you have this, like, just this mindset about you about challenging status quo like like you're not going to accept a narrative what advice do you have to to the to the education world about challenging status quo fostering that positive climate in schools for teachers and students like what what should we do about that what's your thoughts it can be a challenge because you know oftentimes you um you 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 when you challenge the status quo when you when you when you seek to walk that path that others don't walk, you could be jeopardizing your mm -hmm. and I'm sure that's the fear, you know, for many a you know, young lady posted on Twitter the other day. I posted something that said, you know, we need leaders, you know, we need to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to support these teachers and hold on, not just recruiting, but retain these folks mm -hmm. that are already there. And she said, Principal L, what I admire most about you is that you never came off your narrative, even under criticism, mm -hmm. you never came off narrative. And I said, I appreciate, it. I don't know if she, if she realizes that, you know, some years ago, you know, my school board tried to fire me simply because I was trying to fight for raises, you know, for teachers. And the only reason why I stayed employed is my teachers actually walked out to mm -hmm. save my, my job. Um, so it can be a challenge when you want to be that voice, when you want to, when you want to fight against mm -hmm. Status quo when you want to start the revolution. So my advice would be first find you a network, find you a find you a group, you know, find find you a wolf pack of people who can support you. It's hard when you're a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. You have a good number of people who can support you. 
you have a little more, you know, a little more power, a little more influence. Um, but also stay close to your morals and your convictions. Mm -hmm. One thing I said I would never do is I would never sign on to do anything that I would not do for my own children, you know, at home and for my own family. When I look at those children in school, right that I see myself in them and I want them to see themselves, you know, in me. And so my advice is follow your heart, but also keep the children at the center of everything we do. They're not the distraction. They are the reason we do. They're the reason we went into this profession. It wasn't the adults. It wasn't the world. It was the children. So let's stay focused on the children. And again, find you a great mentor, find you some colleagues, find you a find you a family in education, like I found, and I consider you family, sir. Uh, just people you can count on, people who will have Ooh. your back. And I think that's how you- That's you amazing. Challenge that status quo and let people know, listen, I've got an army brigade behind me. So be careful, you know, when <laughs> when you when you when you check me because I'm I'm not alone. Well, I'm gonna switch gears on this. Yeah. That was amazing. We're gonna come back to that. But uh it's it's lightning round time on uh talent dead. We're gonna get to know you quick. Lightning round, are you ready? Coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. Beach. Or mountains? Beach, beach, beach. Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, cats or dogs? Oh, cats. My, when I was a kid, cats slept. My cat slept with me every day, all day. Uh, movie night at the theater or cozy night in on Netflix? Ten years ago in the movies, post-pandemic, Netflix <laughs> all day. <laughs> uh, Principal L, are you an early bird or a night owl? I'm actually both. I'm up both. early in the gym and I'm up late worrying about everything. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you love to read fiction or nonfiction books? Uh, early in my life, I was uh, fiction. But it, it, later in my career, I'm all nonfiction, leadership, education. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, favorite superhero, Batman, Superman. Mm, I'm going to say Batman, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, cook at home or go out to a restaurant? I'm a go out to a restaurant guy, but I love to eat home cooked meals. <laughs> uh, right. just, Principal I, L, riding the fence, riding the fence. Uh, how about this one? Summer or winter activities? What do you like better? Summer, summer, summer. Yes. And would we would we catch you dancing to your favorite tunes or singing in the shower? Mm, see, I'm gonna be on the fence again because I'm a singer and I'm and I love old school hip hop, so I'm always rapping in my class. Nice. So you know, and I'm not a I'm not a good dancer, so I'm gonna say singer. Okay, and then the last one, Principal L is walking out. What's your walk up song as you're coming up to the stage? I just spoke at the NASSP Ignite uh, 23 conference in Denver, Colorado, and my walk out was Houdini Friends. How many of us have them? Was my nice. walk out song. So when I'm coming, it's old, it's Run DMC, Houdini, KRS One. It's something positive and something. I love it. I love it. Well, okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back on point here and uh, and a recap. We talked about resilience. We talked about chess. We talked about choosing to stay. Right. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. What is your one call to action that you have for the educators listening today? My one call. I have a list. I, of, I know, uh, man. I, I got, know. I got a whole phone book of calls, right? <laughs> but, but my one call to action would be to let's show up for kids every day. Let, let's, you know, principals who stay in their schools three to five years have greater teacher retention, mm -hmm. stronger uh, positive school cultures. Um, um, and I know it's difficult. It's hard for teachers and administrators. So I'm not saying when you get to that point where you need to go, go, because I'm 36 years in, at some point, I'm going to have to make like mm -hmm. a tree and leave as well. But, but until then, the, until a kid says to me, because my agent always says, you know, when are you leaving? When are you leaving? And, and I say, listen, no, when a kid comes to me and asks me when I'm leaving, I'll leave. But right now, every year kids come and say, are you coming back next year? So my call to action is, Let's make 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 that choice if you can. Mm. The bravest act in challenging times is choosing to stay. Be there for those young people. And then, but when you find it's your time, stand proud of that choice as well to go off into the sunset 
and celebrate the time that you spent with those children, whether it was a season or many for a reason, you have never committed treason. I want to thank you for your <laughs> service and thank you as well, sir, for uh, for giving me an opportunity to be here and share with um, the great folks of your state, Minnesota. Thank you, Principal L. That was amazing. And you did not disappoint. Here's what I want to say. I just want to thank you again for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, your story with us. It's so powerful. And it is just a pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, and as we go, here's what I'm going to say to everybody else. Thank you for tuning in today and watching this episode of Talent Ed. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, leave us a review. If you have any suggestions for future topics or guests, please contact us. And until next time, keep learning, keep growing, choose to stay and stay PKS, which is positive, kind, and supportive. Thanks, everybody. Amen. I love it. Thank mm -hmm. you.